All right, so hi, my name is Richard Ho, and I will be the moderator for this first panel, Huey, the Life and Times of a Revolutionary. So, Huey P. Noon was a revolutionary that brought revolution to the collective consciousness of America. As founder of the Black Panther Party, he understood the needs and struggles of black communities that were not being addressed, or rather, that America at its core was not meant for the survival of black people. He studied the revolutions of the world and recognized that the global struggle would require a global revolution of interconnected communities. But these communities would need to build and ensure their own survival first. And so the Black Panther Party became the household name throughout the country that inspired millions of people, then and now, to work towards revolution. For our panel, we have Yvonne King, who was field secretary of the Illinois chapter of the Black Panther Party. Bill Brown, former coordinator of the Philadelphia chapter of the Black Panther Party. And Dr. Regina Jennings, a member of the East Oakland, California branch of the Black Panther Party that has written 30 published academic articles and written and edited several books, including the award-winning Malcolm X and the poetics of Haki Madhukti and Race, Rage, and Roses. Please give a warm welcome to our speakers in general, and yeah, we can get started. Uh, if the speakers can, please come up over here and yeah. you know, go first. Get comfortable. Um, okay. Yeah, and the uh, first person is Eva. Party was to serve the needs of the oppressed people in our communities and defend them against the oppressors. Among his goals were to implement the 10-point platform and program, to raise the consciousness of the people based on the assumption that no revolution succeeds without the people. That's right. And finally, to develop a political structured political vehicle. This morning I would like to examine how Huey used his trial and how the party mm. Free Huey campaign served as significant steps towards realizing these goals. In October of 1966, when Huey Newton and Bobby Seale got together to articulate a practical course of action, as Huey later described the 10-point platform and program. They discussed the Dells program, MALS, and others, but they con concluded that they couldn't follow any of them. They recognized that the ideas that mobilized the people of Cuba and China sprang from their own history and political structures. Huey realized that their organization's program would have to deal with the history of black people and political structures in the United States. In further describing the 10-point program, Huey pointed out that they left the program open-ended so that it could develop and people could identify with it. We did not offer it as a conclusion we offered it as a vehicle yeah. to move them to a higher level. The first program of the party addressed point number seven. We want an immediate end to police brutality and murder of black people. Patrolling the police with weapons <coughs> in compliance with the law demonstrated to the black community that someone would stand up to the primary symbol of brutality in their daily lives and to teach them that they had a constitutional right to bear arms. 
The armed police patrols often resulting in dramatic confrontations with the police recruited new members into the organization. Although the Panthers' visibility had spread from Oakland to Richmond, Berkeley, and San Francisco, all in the California Bay Area, this new organization was still a local one. However, two events pushed the Panthers into the national limelight. The killing of Denzel Dow yeah. and challenging the Mulford Bill in Sacramento. In April 1967, actually on April 1st, Denzel Dow, a 22-year-old unarmed black man, was killed in North Richmond by members of the Sheriff's Department, which certainly sounds familiar to us mm -hmm. today. When the family was not satisfied with the county's treatment of the case, yep. they reached out to the Black Panthers who conducted their own investigation. That's right. They discovered a number of inconsistencies in the sheriff's report, after which they held a rally on a street corner <coughs> in North Richmond. And of course, they were armed. Bobby and Huey informed the community about their findings, exposing the errors in the police report. The second community meeting focused on what could be done about the treatment of Denzel's case. <clears throat> it was suggested that the family meet with the sheriff who is in charge of the police who patrolled the streets. Excuse me. After the meeting, the Arn Panthers escorted the family to the sheriff's office. The Panthers went armed, as they always did, but in yes. compliance with the law. That's right. Arms in pure, plain view. Right. But even though they hadn't violated any the laws, the, the uh, police would not allow them to enter with the family <laughs> while they had their guns. And the, the family wanted them to accompany them and <coughs> right. the party respected their wishes. So they kept their guns in their car and went in to meet with the sheriff. The party knew that the meeting would not yield the desired results, but it was important to demonstrate to the family that they were going to hit a brick wall. The party was right. No official investigation was ever held into the death of Denzel Dow. And of course, the policeman's fatal action was found to be justified. <coughs> Again, another familiar story. The Panthers took the case to the people. They produced a leaflet describing the case the, bout, the rally, and the party's work with the family. The new full-time Panthers and members of the community, especially those who knew Denzel Dow, circulated the leaflets. The Panthers also tried to pay paper boys, yes, there were paper boys back in the day, um, to insert leaflets, those leaflets, into the Richmond Independent, the Oakland Tribune, and the San Francisco Chronicle. But when the paper boys realized what was on the leaflet, they did it for nothing. The leaflet cost 10 cents, which paid for producing it, and also paid for the Dow's uh, family's funeral expenses. All of this brought the party closer to the people. Let us not forget the people. That's right. In Revolutionary Suicide, Huey sums up the significance of the Denzel Dow case. One, it was critical to the development of the organization. It helped them to launch the organization's paper, and it led to the party's first national exposure. 
in that same month, Huey and Bobby learned about State Assemblies, Assemblyman Donald Mulford's bill to make it illegal <coughs> for the Panthers to patrol with weapons. You have to kind of get this picture, you know, these young black men. There were police patrols in different parts of the country. That was not unique. What was unique was that these young black men were armed. Yes. <clears throat> and but following the law. So that had to be stopped. The Panthers and the Dow family decided that although they would not be able to stop the bill, they would go to Sacramento when it would be introduced on May 2nd. There, Bobby would read the statement Huey wrote for the black communities that raised the issues of police brutality, America's repressive and genocidal policies against people of color, citing black Americans, Latinos, Native Americans, and Vietnamese, and the intention of the Mulford Bill to disarm the people. That statement became the Black Panther Party's executive mandate number one. Although Bobby did read it, what made the news were the images of armed Panthers at the state capitol. Many blacks were impressed with the effort and the message, not to mention the black berets and the black jackets. <laughs> Good looking brothers. Many wanted to establish branches and chapters in their areas. After Sacramento, the Black Panther Party was no longer a local organization in the Bay Area. During the summer of 1967, the same time of the riots in Newark and Detroit, the Panthers continued to grow the organization, especially through developing and selling its paper. They used it to describe events and issues in the community and to inform the people about their rights. The people's consistent response to the paper, paying 25 cents, fortunately, also provided the organization with some much needed revenue. In October 1964, Huey was given a sentence of three years probation for an assault charge. And on October 27, 1967, that probation ended, and Huey wanted to, of course, celebrate. He borrowed his girlfriend's car. She wasn't feeling well, and he hit the streets. By 4 a.m. the next morning, exactly 50 years ago to this day, after being stopped and pulled over by two Oakland cops, Huey was shot in the stomach, one officer was shot, and the other one, Officer John Fry, was shot and killed. Huey was charged with murder, which carried the death penalty, and felony assault. Huey always believed that he would be convicted and executed. And this is extremely important yeah, yeah. to take note of. Yeah. It's no light thing, That's as right. we know today, That's right. um, when somebody <coughs> is charged with murder, when they are facing the death penalty in this system here. Huey always, <clears throat> he wrote in Revolutionary Suicide that, quote, my fear was not of death itself, but a death without meaning. Mm -hmm. I wanted my death to be something that people could relate to. Right. A basis for further mobilization of the community. Huey wanted to use the courtroom and the media 
to educate the people. In addition to police brutality, he hoped the trial would show other forms of violence poor people have to endure, like unemployment, poor housing, inferior education, lack of public facilities, and then the inequity of the draft. Today we should remember as Huey did when he wrote in 1973, Revolutionary Suicide, the system in fact destroys us through neglect much more often than the police revolver. The political significance of the trial was paramount. All else was secondary. Consequently, the party decided that the lawyers would not be involved in any political decision. And I want you to also really understand what this meant. This was a political case. Huey decided, you know, the party decided this you have politics and you have the, le the legality. We will see how he actually used this claim. The legal counsel, Charles Garrett, respected the party's wishes to stay out of political decisions. Gary not only was a brilliant trial lawyer, but he was committed to defending the politically, racially, and socially depressed. Huey and Gary used pretrial motions, jury selection, and Huey's testimony to raise the people's consciousness. To expose some of the inherent injustices within the criminal justice system, Gary filed a series of pretrial motions to question the validity of the grand juries in order to prove the indictment was illegal and unjust. Grand juries are exclusively prosecutorial tools where none of the witnesses who are all called by the prosecutor face cross-examination. Selecting the jury is one of the most important aspects of any criminal defense. In this death penalty case, each side, prosecutor and the defense, had 20 peremptory challenges, which means they can reject, they can use the challenge to reject any prospective juror without giving a reason. Oh. Huey instructed Gary to use them all in order to show that people could not be judged by a jury of their peers. Point number nine of the 10 point program states, we want all black people when brought to trial to be tried in court by a jury of their peer group or people from their black communities as defined by the Constitution of the United States. <laughs> Huey's jury consisted of 11 whites and one black. The black David Harper was a Bank of America executive, which probably is the reason why the prosecution accepted him. <laughs> when Huey testified in the courtroom, ironically, Harper became his entire audience. And in the side, David Harper became the foreman of the jury. The trial began July 15, 1968, and the state took about three weeks to put on the defense. I'm sorry, to put on its case, the prosecution. Then on August 19th, the defense began. Charles Gary initially called some black witnesses to testify about their experiences with racist police in their communities focusing on their encounters with John Fry, the cop Huey was charged with murdering. In most criminal cases, 
defendants don't testify because it's believed they will not survive the prosecution's cross-examination. However, consistent with Huey's commitment to use the trial as a vehicle to educate the people, he decided to testify, even though his life, again, literally, was on the line. Yeah. That was a political decision, not a legal one. That was Huey's decision, not his lawyer's. However, Gary's political background, and having now worked with Huey for more than six, six months, he understood the decision and developed the direct examination accordingly. After denying having killed John Fry, and assaulting Officer Haynes, Huey was able to describe his family growing up in Oakland, where blacks suffered from poor living conditions, inadequate and degrading public schools, and racist police occupying their communities. Gary's examination also enabled the Minister of Defense to describe the co-founding of the Black Panther Party and what it stood for and he was even able to recite and explain the 10-point program. Even during cross-examination, Huey found opportunities to educate the people. From the time Huey was charged and throughout the trial, Panthers were building a campaign to free Huey by taking his case to the masses. The Free Huey slogan grew out of coalition between the Black Panther Party and the Peace and Freedom Party, which consisted mainly of young whites who opposed the war, the war in Vietnam. The party also developed coalitions with movements among the Asians, the Latinos, and Native Americans. Aaron Dixon, who was head of the Seattle chapter, the first chapter organized outside of California, wrote in his memoir, My People Are Rising, reminisced about the sentiment within the party among the comrades. And he says, we wore our free Huey buttons on our leather coats and fatigues as badges of honor hoping that someday Huey would come home. Right. Huey P. Newton was our guiding force. Right. It was Huey who had the courage to lead a band of armed and well-disciplined black men to confront equally armed white racist police officers. Mm -hmm. And as a result, he became wanted and a hunted man eventually cornered and threatened with death. Kathleen Cleaver was the first communications secretary, um, worked hard on the Free Huey campaign, and she describes it as continuous rounds of demonstrations, rallies, and meeting with local organizations and the television coverage our mobilization received were capturing people's imagination. High school kids, college students, ex-convicts, <laughs> veterans, religious people, hardworking people, bikers, hippies, artists, <laughs> writers, and middle class folks all became supporters. Yeah. Many joined the party the momentum accelerated. New chapters opened in Los Angeles, Sacramento, and San Diego. In addition, some members of the Central Committee and traveled throughout the U.S. and sometimes outside of the country organizing support committees. Dixon informs us that Chief of Staff David Hilliard and another Panther Landon Williams, attempted to go to Cuba to solicit support for Huey's trial, but were detained in Mexico City. 
The iconic poster of Huey in the wicker chair was found not only in cities throughout this country, but copies of it were also found in parts of Europe, Asia, and South America. So that on the first day of Huey's trial, July, 5,000 de demonstrators and about 450 Panthers were out front of the Alameda County Courthouse showing their support, chanting, free Huey. Huey was convicted of manslaughter instead of murder and found not guilty of felony assault. He saw it as a compromise verdict. Took him off the death penalty, you right. know, wasn't by right. enough. Right. But Huey had faith in the people in the party when he stated, among other things, his position on the verdict, and I quote, I am very sure that we will get a new trial, not because of the kindness that the appellate courts will show us, but because of the political pressure that we have applied to the establishment. And we will do this by organizing this, the community so that they can display their will. In spite of Huey's conviction, his sacrifice and vision to use his trial to educate and mobilize the people and grow the Black Panther Party clearly was a victory. The party continued the Free Huey campaign until he was freed in August 1970. In the spirit of revolutionaries here and throughout the world, I say all power to the All power all to the people. <laughs> So the next speaker will be Bill Brown. Yes, Bill. <laughs> Unbelievable. That was great. I got to keep it close. <laughs> good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here, make this presentation to you. Talk about our beloved brother, fallen comrade, Brother Hugh P. Newton. You know, <clears throat> when a young brother called me and said, hey, you know, we want you to be a part of this uh, conference we got coming up and we'll be talking about Huey P. Newton. I said, you doing what? <laughs> so yeah, we're talking about Huey P. Newton. You know, we want to, you know, commemorate and we want to talk about revolutionary intercommunalism and uh, reactionary suicide and revolutionary suicide. I said, whoa, that's heavy. <laughs> <laughs> but I always like to uh, deal with the historical relevance of the party. And because I don't think that's, we get that enough. Because the people in the communities and the people around the world may not know that the party was really drenched in the black historical experience. And it came out of that. You know, that's for example, the image that the party got with the Panther it came out of Lowes County, that's right, that's right. you know, the Freedom Organization. And they were uh, marching, uh, they said the folks down there was trying to stop them from <clears throat> registering the vote. And when they went to register the vote, folks came at them and they, they, they was, had an emblem of a fighting cock, you know. They was, the, the, the white racists down there had an image of that. So the brothers and sisters came up with the idea of the panther. Because the panther, is an animal, it's an aristocratic cat. And um, it doesn't eat meat. 
So when they kill, they kill for sport or challenge. That's why when you, like if you see them hunting for a panther up there, you go up, you know, they go out in the jungle to hunt. They don't hunt panthers like they hunt lions. You know, because you got to go way up in the jungle to find the panther. He's aristocratic, you see, and he's territorial. Maintains his space as long as you let leave him in his space, he's cool. So I'm saying, but you get in his space. <laughs> you know I me. Mean? But the point is, is that the ten point platforming program, which was the basic program of the party, and the most important thing, and is the reason why the party got in, got all the repression that came down on the party, it was all about that ten point platforming program. And like Bubba Huey said, it was really a ten point platform program, uh, twenty points because it's what we want and then what we believe. But if you look at the end of that program, and I heard one of the brothers mention um, the boys early, you know, the boys had a piece on black reconstruction in America. And basically the ten point platform and program came right out of emancipation and reconstruction. Because if you take that last point, the 10th point, the the ten point, it summarizes that one, land, bread, housing, education, clothing, justice, and peace. That was everything that they said when they came in out of the emancipation. Okay, so it was drenched in that. And then, <clears throat> I remember, I heard Bobby say one time, he said, uh, you know, if Brother Malcolm hadn't got killed and had been allowed to uh, build the OAAU, the party might never, never came into existence. But Malcolm got killed in 65, the party came into existence in 1966, a year later, after the Watts riots. See, this is how we're drenched in history. Malcolm's killing. That summer in August was when Watts came about because the leadership was taken off the scene. So Malcolm was doing that. He was building that organization, mass organization, international organization. And so when they took that head, the body was angry. You see what I'm saying? And the brothers and sisters, they hit the streets, they were rioting. That's one of the main things the party wanted to emphasize. They didn't want the community, you know, because due to Rots riots, they had, uh, you know, a lot of destruction and went on, and the brothers and sisters was out there, you know, but they didn't have organization. And that's what the party wanted to bring, organization. We can't just be out here throwing bricks and bottles and burning and doing all this. We need to be organized. We need to have a plot, platform and program. We need to have a plan. We need to come out of the, uh, uh, the environment of history so that we know that this was not just no, you know, oop de doop de over the night thing. It was a program. And it was an important program. You know, Chase said that revolutionaries are social artists. See, we're supposed to make art. See, I'm gonna try to do a little bit of that today. Make a little art, you know. That means you're supposed to get the conversation going so good that the people can relate to it so good. Fred Hampton used to say, you know, I love the people. You know, I get high off the people. You know what I mean? I get high off the people. You know, because he says I'm astronomically motivated. You see, I'm lumber proletariat intoxicated. Too damn bad to be intimidated. Right? So, you know, this brother and so many brothers and sisters. I see we got my brother, Mamir. His picture's over there. You know, Mamir was 15 years old when he was in the party. That's right. He was the youngest cat amongst us. <laughs> but he was a brilliant journalist from the door. And we say, but then, well, man, you know, we had a little article in the paper about something, 
and my man would wipe this, make that thing like it was, you know, front page. <laughs> and we, anything we had, we'd take it to my man, you know, get it done. Brother could write, you know what I mean? And uh, he, I mean, he's so committed, he would go to sleep at the typewriter. <laughs> In them days, they still had typewriters. <laughs> I don't know what they got today, but I'm saying, you know, uh, that's 15 years old, man, committed, you know, and I heard, uh, I had a, we had a tape that Brother Fred Hampton had sent down, and I was telling Yvonne, Sister Yvonne, he said, uh, he was talking about Yvonne King, how committed she was, you know what I mean, I'm saying, damn, I heard Fred Hampton talking about you, yeah. <laughs> So, you know, give our sister another hand, because she's, you know what I mean? See, see, that's what I want to do. I want to get it going. See, that sister Regina there, she's Oakland. That's where the original thing kicked off, you see? Uh, Bunchy and John and, uh, and, and little Bobby Hutton, you know what I mean? You know, Bunchy said, uh, uh, the genius of Huey P. Newton's was the fact that uh, Huey was able to put the party together because uh, our family came from the South. Most of the family of brothers and sisters in the, out there on the West Coast that came from the South and that the party sprung up on the West Coast. Uh, and in the South where our parents were, they were surrounded by racism. You see what I'm saying? They couldn't move, you know? But when he came up on the West Coast, we had a little more freedom. And he said uh, Huey was able to recognize that. He was able to recognize that. So uh, he knew that uh, when they was in the South, you know, the, the racist folks uh, the, was all around, surrounded them. When we got on the, in the West Coast, uh, it was different, you know? we only seen them when we went to school or, or when the milkman came through or something like that, you know, they come through. And he said, uh, but we was down in these ghettos and we knew we had to survive and in order to survive we had to fight. But we had been able to do that. And so Huey recognized that. He, looked, he said, man, these guys, you know, these guys on these corners, they're some tough guys, you know. Now if I could organize them, <laughs> and get them, you know, they ain't, they ain't scared of nothing. He said, Bunchy said, we didn't have no fear because we didn't know what fear was. <laughs> See, our parents knew what fear was because they were surrounded by it. But we didn't. We was young, just like y'all, young people. See, you know, got all these demands. I'm like, I mean, I'm listening at them demands, you know, and I'm saying, oh, Lord. <laughs> what? We want this, and you better get it, you know. And I'm like, whoa, that's how we was? <laughs> you know, see, when you get older, you get a little bit, you know. You know, you don't change your, 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 your mood, you see what I mean? You don't, you just learn to take it a little slower. <laughs> you know, a little more observant, <laughs> you know. But uh, we got to make sure that we do something about getting our brother out, right. Brother Mamiya, because he has no right to be in there. Right. And we know that. That's right. You know, I've had police officers tell me, you better know that. Okay? Cold blooded setup. Cold blooded setup, you know. And really, it was about that pen. That's what it was about. Okay, 15 years old. <laughs> so, Bubba Huey, he talked about uh, revolutionary suicide. And he talked about, uh, he said, uh, somebody asked me, he said, well, uh, so the party will be your family. You know, you don't have, you know, he didn't have a biological family, he had no children. And he said, uh, well, the party requires a great deal of sacrifice. But in order to sacrifice, you need love. Okay. This is the ladder here. This is here we, you know, coming down to the real deal. He's saying uh, he had watched, uh, he had read a book 
by um, a brother named Herbert Hendon who did a study on black suicide. And he found that 80% of black suicides occur because of the lack of loss of a lover. Or the lack of loss of love in general. Okay, he said whites committed suicide because they lost position, prestige, power, you know, things like that. But blacks committed suicide for the lack of love. Because this is all we have. You see? And this is why this is all we can give to the party or give to the people. You see? He said, not because some psychologist or some sociologist said that I have a suicidal tendency, you know. And he said, but because I'm willing to make any com uh, com um, sacrifice as long as the sacrifice is compensated through the fraternity. And this was at the time of a lot of internal contradictions and stuff in the party. And he said, uh, what happens when the fraternity is broken? Where's the love going to come from? Where's the backup going to come from? You see? And so they got into the whole thing about the fraternal and fratricidal relations of revolutionaries, you know, and all that there. But the fact is that without love, and this is when they were talking with Erickson, him and Erickson was talking, and Erickson was the psychologist. And um, he said uh, they, found, they figured out that true love and true love, okay, and this is dialectical, this is material, this is uh, the ideology that the parties uh, subscribe to. He said, in true love, both partners have dignity. Okay. Both partners have dignity. And when you have that, you have true love. But if either of the two partners do not have dignity, there's no love there. And that's the whole relationship between the party and the people and the people in the party. And you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So this brother's gone now. So many are gone. And yet we're still in, deep in this struggle. See, I didn't have nothing laid out to talk to y'all about. See what I'm saying? I can, I'm speaking to you from the heart. Okay. Thank you. All right? Because that's how we were trained to give in the party. See, we just gave. You know what I mean? We, man, half the time, we didn't even know where we were going to get the next meal from sometimes. <laughs> all the kids, out there, we said, yeah, the kids had all the breakfast. <laughs> Wasn't no breakfast for us. <laughs> that's all right. We're going to get some more, you know. But the important thing that I see is what I was saying earlier about the love. Because you are testimony of that today. See, that the love is resilient. This is what Maya Angelou said when you met when she said, We still we rise. The love is resilient and it's in the people. That's why Fred said he loved the people, you know. And and so it's important to remember revolutionary intercommunalism. That's what the media calls globalization. Okay? So we make that clear. That's about globalization. And it's really about America as a technological empire. World technocracy. See, that's what it's all about. But Huey pointed out that this technology can serve the people too. And that's the important thing. That the people have to use the technology to serve themselves and, if, and, and, and each other. We can actually get, you know, Malcolm said this. He said, America's in a unique position. She's the only country on earth that's actually able to have a bloodless revolution. He said, all she got to do is give black man and woman everything that she, owe, that she owes them. And the fight will be over. <laughs> what he said. If you can go back and listen to it, it's there. It's on there. He said it. And of course, we know about what happened with that. But I'm just saying, the potential is there. But it's all about the people 
you know, it's all about the people and their potential for love. Revolutionary love. See, revolution, Huey pointed out, was the basic contradiction between the old and the new. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't necessarily have to be an antagonistic struggle. It's the kinds of obstacles that get in the path. The friction, you see? And basically, that basic contradiction here today is about property. Those who have property and those who don't have property. The haves and the have-nots. You know? And you got a constitution that said you're supposed to regulate that. See, you got three prongs of government. You got a judiciary, you got a legislative, and you got an executive. And they're supposed to check and balance the process. So what's up with that? <laughs> See, what's up with that, right? You know what I mean? So all I can say to you, brothers and sisters, yes, mighty contribution from Brother Huey P. Newton. And in the spirit of Brother Huey P. Newton, I say thank you and love you. All power to the people. Last but not least, we have Dr. Regina Jennings. Give a warm welcome there. All right. I'm so glad to be here. I'm just, what am I doing? What? What happened? You're laying on the keyboard. Oh. Okay. Up, uh, up. Uh, well, I wasn't going to talk about them right now. Okay. But. So we can leave Huey up. Uh, is it anything here that can hold it? I have to hold it? Yeah. Okay, I'll can hold it. hold it for you? No. No. <laughs> no. Tell me if that wasn't sweet. Okay. And, um, oh, S speaking of sweetness, all right, I had told uh, Brandon that I had a surprise for him. I have two surprises for him and for you. This is Dr. Huey P. Newton's dissertation, and it's called War Against the Panthers. This is his dissertation. And why this is so important is because very often we forget that he died, Dr. Huey P. Newton, and you all are students. See, I know some of you are graduate students. You know what it means to get a PhD, to be on your way to a PhD. Well, here's his dissertation. And um, let me give you another reason why this is imperative. One of the uh, people, one of the men that Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale made, because see, Panthers made men and women, <laughs> is Paul Coates. Yeah. Paul Coates started Black Classic Press. That's right. who prints Huey P. Newton's dissertation. So, you know, contact them and get your own copy of Dr. Huey P. Newton's dissertation, okay? Um, my next surprise, well, before I get to my next surprise for Brandon and you all, uh, I just, I wanna thank Brandon and I wanna thank the Black and Brown Coalition for putting together this very important conference. I mean, I'm... You know, I mean, honestly, I'm overwhelmed. I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm so happy to see you all, and you're clapping for Huey. I mean, this is, I, I walk with Huey every day, and I mean that very seriously, maybe every other day, but certainly pretty regularly, you know, I conjure up Huey P, because he, like I said, he was a maker of men and women. I mean, this is, this, this, this is a remarkable cat here. This is, I mean, I, I, the descriptions, I can't even, I won't even go into all my accolades for him. Um, but I do want to say this, that uh, Huey P. Newton uh, was, is a hero. And even that term hero comes out of uh, something that Huey P. Newton would appreciate. 
Hero comes from the word Heru, from like 10,000 years before the, uh, I was going to say Christian era, but before the common era. Heru comes from Africa, ancient Africa, you dig? You see? Heru, Hero, was the immaculate son of Asa, Aset, or Wasiri, Waseta. And then when the Greeks conquered Africa, they changed the names to Osiris and Isis. Heru was their son. Heru means hero. And that's what our beloved Dr. Huey P. Newton is and was. You all probably know this, but I just want to repeat it. Huey wrote Revolutionary Suicide. I know many of you, especially from the African Free School, um, the African Saturday School, Saturday, Saturday. Saturday Free School. I knew I'd get it at some point. <laughs> and that um, Saturday African Free School, well, no, it's just uh, Saturday free that Saturday Free School is exceedingly important because it does what Huey and Bobby intended for black studies to do. And let me just, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but since I'm here, I'll stay. <laughs> Huey Newton and Bobby Seale started black studies and people don't know that. It's not written in any book, but it will be written in mine, okay? Huey P. Newton started black studies. Do you hear me, people? I'll get into how he and Bobby did that in just a moment. But I want all of you students to know this. If you take any black studies course in any university, well, you ought to say thank you, Huey P. Newton. Thank you, Bobby G. Seale, because they started black studies. Now. Okay, I'm going to briefly talk about Huey P. Newton's absolute bravery, his originality, his conviction, and I'm also going to share what I think will be some unknown facts about Huey and about Bobby and um, how black poetry, I do poetry too, uh, so I'm always interested in finding poetry as foundations for things. But black poetry fits inside of the relationship of Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale and how the Black Panther Party was started. So that's pretty much what I'm going to talk about. Um, Huey P. Newton was born February 17, 1942 in Monroe, Louisiana. He was assassinated on August 22, 1989. Huey was an Aquarian. One of the most visionary and intellectual signs of the Zodiac. And when I talk about the Zodiac, I'm really talking about the ancient African Zodiac, not the Greek watered down one. Okay, because back in the day, civilizations across the world looked at star patterns and made decisions about what a person would be or do. So... This is why I included that little Zodiac clip about Huey in my talk, okay? Now, it's very interesting about August, the month of August. Now, Huey was murdered, assassinated, set up to be killed in August. August is also when Nat Turner, okay, did what he did. Now, check that out, August 22nd through the 23rd. Turner was captured October 30th. Huey and Bobby brainstormed about forming some kind of organization between October 20th and the 22nd. Now, this is my second surprise for Brother Brandon, Revolutionary Love, and you all. I have, uh, and I think they are the last speeches of Huey Newton, what he actually said 
before he left the earth, before he was assassinated. So I wanted to actually read a part of what was on Huey's mind in 1986, December. And this is a speech he gave in Oakland. He starts off, Freddie Roberts must be released. We must continue to work for that. I'm very uncomfortable speaking. I've never been too good at lecturing. They used to say I was pretty good with the gun, no. It is very important to keep our history going. Too often, black history is not recorded. It's forgotten. This keeps us from knowing, from knowing what direction to go in the future. You might not have the Black Panther Party, but you have the Uhuru House. You might not have the Black Panther newspaper, but you have the Burning Spear. So they really haven't done anything by crushing one organization. One time when I talked to some Vietnamese during the Vietnamese War, when the United States was attempting to enslave those three people, I kept saying I was a freedom fighter, that I was fighting for freedom. The Vietnamese said, no, nah, no, nah, don't say that. I said, what's wrong with saying that? They said, we fight because we are free. Oh, we fight against slaves. I can imagine that sometime a group of slaves will get shackles and put them on a free people, and it is our job to be released from those shackles. And perhaps we can make the slaves free also. That puts us in a position to know who we are and who we are fighting against. We're fighting against an unconscious people. We're fighting against an unconscious people, blind people and slaves. We have to fight from a strong attitude and know that we're free and we'll break the shackles in order to free everyone else. That's the nature of the struggle. It's not truly a race struggle. Some slaves turn it into that, but we must see the light. I've been tried, and this is very important, y'all. This is me talking, not Huey. Now listen to, listen to this. I've been tried at least two times a year for 30 years now, do you hear this? I'm going to say it again. I've been tried at least two times a year for about 20 years now. They have been about, there have been about 58 charges against me altogether. They've charged me for everything but being a child of God. Due to the people's will, though, I'm still here. Sometimes I'm amazed at the power of the people because I didn't believe that I would live to be over 25. Good Lord, that's me. The good Lord, that's not you. And then after that, I didn't think I would ever get out of prison. But I'm here. I think this is mainly because of the movement exposing the government through the Freedom of Information Act. At one time, the movement was in a high ebb. And then we restructured. But I see a growing spirit here in Oakland. It's beautiful to see the young people singing those lines because we are building a revolutionary fervor in our youth. I'll be very brief because I'm scared to death of speaking to more than two or three people at a time. That used to be Bobby Seale's job. I'm going to stop right there. Because now I want to talk to you about the amazing friendship that developed between Huey Newton and Bobby Seale. Now, Huey and Bobby were students at Merritt College in Oakland, California during the early 60s. And at Merritt College, they attended these outside workshops that were put together by Donald Warden. And at these workshops, they would talk about the freedom struggle that was going on, Malcolm X, Fannie Lou Hamer, 
uh, uh, Nelson Mandela when he was, you know, really doing his thing in South Africa. So they would, you know what I mean? Um, these are the things they would talk about. Now, Bobby would hear Huey. Huey would hear Bobby. They really didn't know each other. But then after a while, both Bobby and Huey, they got tired of what they called armchair revolutionaries. If you're going to be a revolutionary, be a revolutionary. The books are good. Quoting theory is great. Collecting history is a monster. But how are you going to deal with the people if you're isolated in college? So, it was during the time of what's now called the Black Arts Movement. And they were listening to black poetry. I'm talking about Huey, Bobby, and everybody. They were listening to black poetry by the then Leroy Jones, who became, of course, our beloved Amiri Baraka. And um, Bobby Seal liked to recite other people's poetry, okay? And Huey liked poetry, but just like where I stopped in his speech, Huey really didn't like to talk before the public. He really, that wasn't Huey, okay? But he really liked to listen to other people do poetry. So by this time, him and Bobby Seale did become friends because they were already talking about, and this is like around 63, 64, they were already talking about we got to do more for our people. We don't know what we want to do, but we definitely got to do more. They were even talking about, well, let's join um, Malcolm X's new group, you know, but Malcolm was soon after killed, so we know where that went. So anyway, one day, Huey, Bobby, Weasel, and Bobby's brother John, they decided, well, let's go to the record store. Let's go to the record store in Berkeley. And let's get some blues album. They like the blues. Y'all don't even know the blues, do you? <laughs> if I could sing, I'd sing a line. I can't. But in any event, and I would sing it because you would like it. So Huey wanted to get an album by T-Bone Walker or right, Howlin' Wolf. All right, y'all can look up on the internet, you know, to get a sense. All right. <laughs> so anyway, he said, well, this is Huey now. Well, let's go to the... Um, record store on the Berkeley campus because it was wide, it was big, it had more selections than the record stores in Oakland. Does everybody agree? Okay. So while the brothers were en route to Berkeley, Huey says, Bobby, do one of them poems I like, man. Do one of them poems, you know. So Bobby, if you ever hear him speak even now, he's very animated, you know. And he was at that time a, 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 a stand-up comedian and everything. So he was like, yeah, anytime you give Bobby a stage, he's going to take that <laughs> stage. All right? So Bobby jumps up and he does this poem. It was called, Uncle Sammy, call me fool of Lucifer. Okay, so he did the poem. The brothers, you know, they're going on to the record store. They're feeling good. Yeah, we got the black poetry. We're getting ready to get the blues. Fabulous. So they get to Berkeley. Berkeley campus, um, and Huey says to Bobby, Bobby, do that poem again. So Weasel went and got a, one of them chairs for Bobby to stand up on, and Bobby Seal hollers again, Uncle Sammy call me fool of Lucifer. It was a um, black man's anti-Vietnamese war uh, poem. Well, as you might imagine, on a college campus, like Temple. Here come the white students. <laughs> Here come the black students. Here come the Indian students. Here come the Asian students. They were like, well, yeah, man, do that again. <laughs> now, Bobby, well, of course. Yes, I certainly will. Bobby blew the poem again. And the students were, again, again. Bobby blew the poem and then the police came. Well, 
The police did not appreciate that poem as well as the students did. <laughs> so they said, stop speaking. So Bobby did the right thing. He ignored them <laughs> and kept on doing the poem and the students were winning. Well, the police called back up, but they didn't know Huey was Bobby's friend. Backup came. They tried to pull Bobby off his little stage that was a chair. <laughs> Huey leapt onto the cops like Spider-Man. <laughs> he didn't fight him. This is what he did. He talked Huey's legalese. <laughs> Bobby Seale has the right to speak. This is a public place. You have no right to stop this man from speaking. We all want to see this poem. We all, or hear this poem. Well, the police made an error. They hit Huey. Huey, Weasel, John, the students, a melee occurred. All right? More police were called. Bobby Seal got trampled. When he got up from the ground, he saw Huey being put in a police car. Bobby had $60 in his pocket. He said, let me go and get Huey out of jail. Bobby, blood coming on down his he, he gets to the uh, <coughs> precinct. Well, what do you think happened when he walked in the precinct? The police beat him some more and arrested him. Now check this out. It was a whole bunch of people arrested the students and you know other people were already in the jail, black. So what they did though, they put Huey in one jail and they put a one cell and they put Bobby in another. But they could, you know how I'm looking out at you and you're looking at Huey and Bobby could see each other. They nodded to each other. And at that moment, they knew they had to do something about police brutality. This was not the only time that they had been harassed like this. It was not the only time that brothers in particular, and sisters, but particularly brothers, were just stopped by the police, injured by the police, hurt by the police, humiliated by the police. They knew then, uh-uh, this has got to stop. So when they did get out of jail, they were talking vigorously, vigorously. This is the power of friendship. This is why we all need each other. Like I said, like, no, not like I said, like Huey had said. Huey really didn't like to give speeches. Well, Bobby did. So that was a wonderful combination. They thought alike, but Bobby could carry forward. Okay, what Huey felt that he could, and although Huey could do a speech now, don't get me wrong, but Bobby was just a very dramatic speaker. Okay, <laughs> after being in jail and bruised and everything, going back to the workshops got really tired. They wanted to do more, okay? And at the same time, they looked around the college and they said, you know, we paying all this money to go to school and all we do is learn about white people. That don't make no sense. Dr. Montiero, you'll appreciate this. They said, we know about W.B. Du Bois. Why ain't he taught here? Okay? Lorenzo Turner, Albert Mimi, why aren't there some Franz Fanon, why aren't there black scholars and white scholars who deal with black issues fairly, why aren't they taught here? Huey said, well, you know, that, that makes a lot of sense, so we got to demand black studies. This is 64, 65. This is before the Black Panther Party. This is just Huey and Bobby hanging together. These are the kind of conversations that they had. So, okay, they decided, all right, we're going to demand black study. Now, this is just two people. And I want everybody in this room to understand I'm just talking about two brothers. Just two. Not the multitudes. Two. So they said, okay, let's read all the literature about how the university functions and what it means for students, yada, yada. They did. Then Huey said, okay, we'll either 
we won't go see the president right away. Let's go see the person underneath the president. Bobby said, cool, okay. They made a nice appointment. They were students. They saw this administrator. And of course, the administrator said to them, we don't have enough money to hire any faculty. We don't have any, you know, uh, uh, extra funds to put together a new curriculum. And, and most insultingly, they said, it's not enough information out there to teach black people anything, anyway. Well, that didn't sit too well <laughs> with these two brothers. That didn't go over well at all. So Huey decided, okay, let's try another tactic. Let's deal with the president, all right? But this time, you go in, Bobby, by yourself. Lay out what we want. I'll show up a little later. All right, Huey. Bobby gets the appointment with the president of the college. The president politely told Bobby what his uh, assistant had told him, not enough money, not enough information, it can't be done, la, 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 la. So while the president was giving Bobby these lines, in bus Huey P. Newton. Mr. President, I'm here to support Bobby Seale and his proposal for black studies. We should have black studies here at this college. This college is surrounded by a black community. On and on and on and on. Huey cited legal reasons, ethical reasons, moral reasons why there should be black studies at Merritt College. Well, you can imagine, and by the way, I need to really dramatize this. <laughs> Huey went by the secretaries. Huey went by the assistants. Huey, nobody was going to stop him from seeing the president to support Bobby Seale and his proposal for black studies. You don't take no for an answer, people. How do you want to be a visionary and, and just take no? Well, they said we can. Yes, you can. Thank you. Yes, you can. Yes. And please don't think of Obama when I say this, because I hate him. Yeah. <laughs> Montero made me hate it, because me and Montero, we used to fight when, when Barack first got in office. Because I was like, now, now you know. Now, yeah, well, Montero was right. But I digress. And I'm wrapping, I'm wrapping this up now. OK. You can imagine the president was startled. He's these two guys, articulate. One is articulate and nuts. You know, he, he, he couldn't he couldn't even go call up backup. He was so you know because Julie was citing chapter and verse why there should be black studies at Marin College. Okay, and of course they did get escorted out. But do you know the genius of Huey P. Newton, the bravery of Huey P. Newton? the originality of Huey P. Newton. You know what he did? They kept coming back. Mm -hmm. Young people, mm -hmm. don't stop. stop. Yeah, Tell them, Brown. Yeah. Tell them, Brown. Yeah. You don't stop. I mean, and don't worry about getting hurt feelings. Don't worry about anything like that. Just never stop. And because these two brothers never stopped, they wore the administration down. And check it, once they kept doing this, don't you think other students joined them? It got to be more than just Huey and Bobby. They started it. More students demanded black studies. And that, my friends, is the origination of black studies on any college or university campus. Again, if you take a black studies course, you need to thank this brother right here and his partner, Bobby Seale, because they did it. And it's really, really something for me as a, a, a college teacher myself, and I've done the research, no book 
says Huey and Bobby started Black Studies. They'll list all these other people. They'll list San Francisco State. That was years later. Huey and Bobby did that. Okay? That's black power. That's black power. Revolutionary suicide, people. That's what's up. If you really are a revolutionary, then be a revolutionary. Walk in the shadow and the motion of Huey P. Newton. Huey was always talking about consciousness. He was always talking about history and the importance of it. Know your history and use it today to solve any problem that you feel is any kind of a challenge. And I'm going to wrap this up by saying this and reminding you of this. The Black Panther Party, after Black Studies, because they, Huey and Bobby created Black Studies first. The party was not even considered. Ain't that something? The Black Panther Party started with two men. That's it. There was no Brown or Yvonne or Fred Hampton or Bunchy Carter or John Huggins, who I'm going to talk about when I do poetry later in this conference. Erica Huggins, Kathleen Cleaver, Eldridge, Landon. They didn't exist. They came after Huey and Bobby put the vision together. You don't need the masses. If you have something that you think is important and you got one other person that supports your idea, you can create your own heaven on earth. Power to the people. keep that knowledge traveling down from generations to generations. It is so essential to all the work that we do. So thank you all so much for being here, for starting this day off with all of that knowledge and all of that wisdom. So you know, we gotta keep it going, we gotta keep it going. Unfortunately, we are on like a time limit. So next up, we are gonna have a poem from Mary Baraka. Good. Um, Kira. Where's Kira? Yeah, Kira's gonna do a little introduction for us. Come on up here. Kira, round of applause. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Okay. Um, I'd just like to take time to introduce our. <laughs> I just want to take the time to introduce the series of art and the poems. So, um, the goal of the Saturday Free School in this portion of the conference is to encourage the creation of art that raises the consciousness of everyday people. In this segment, we will not only show that art takes many forms, from writing to dance to song, but that art in and of itself can be as revolutionary as the artist who created it. Art allows us all to visualize the beauty in the struggle to liberation. Art grows and changes with the people because art is the people. Every artistic piece is a call for community and solidarity. James Baldwin once said, quote, the role of the artist is exactly the same as the role of the lover. If I love you, if I love you, I have to make you conscious of the things you don't see. Oh <laughs> These next pieces are from Artists in Love. Artists in love with peace, in love with knowledge, in love with the idea that liberation can be a reality, and in love with the people. Many are present today to tell you what they've learned and unlearned through art, leading us all into a state of consci consciousness. So to begin, the first installment in the Saturday Free School and Black and Brown Coalition series of art is a poem by writer and revolutionary Amiri Baraka. 
A public reading of the poem in 2002 resulted in Baraka being told by the governor of New Jersey to resign from his position as poet laureate of New Jersey, a, pos a position that was assigned to him by that same governor. Um, <laughs> Um, Baraka refused to resign and refused to apologize for the poem. So the New Jersey government had no legal standing to make him resign. So they created an act to abolish the position completely. Um, so uh, Mary Baraka was the second and last poet laureate of New Jersey. <laughs> and the poem he read in 2002 is entitled, Somebody Blew Up America. Somebody blew up America. All thinking people oppose terrorism, both domestic and international. But one should not be used to cover the other. Somebody blew up America! They say it's some terrorist, some barbaric Arab in Afghanistan. It wasn't our American terrorists, it wasn't the Klan, or the skinheads, or the them that blows up nigger churches or reincarnates us on death row. It wasn't Trent Lott, or David Duke, or Giuliani, or Shunla, Helms retiring. It wasn't the gonorrhea in costume, the white sheet diseases that have murdered black people, terrorized reason and sanity, most of humanity, as they please is. They say, who say, who do the saying? Who is them paying? Who tell the lies, who in disguise? Who had the slaves, who got the bucks out the bucks? who got fat from plantations, who genocided Indians, tried to waste the black nation. Who live on Wall Street, the first plantation? Who cut your nuts off? Who rape your mom? Who lynch your pa? Who got the tar? Who got the feathers? Who had the match? Who set the fires? Who killed and hired? Who say they God? Still be the devil. Who the biggest only? Who the most goodest? Who did Jesus resemble? Who created everything? Who the smartest? Who the greatest? Who the richest? Who say you ugly and they the good lookingest? <laughs> who define art? Who define science? Who made the bombs? Who made the guns? Who bought the slaves? Who sold them? Who call you them names? Who say Dama wasn't insane? Who, 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 who? Who stole Puerto Rico? Who stole the Indies, the Philippines, Manhattan, Australia, and the Hebrides? Who forced opium on the Chinese? Who owned them buildings? Who got the money? Who think you funny? Who lock you up? Who owned the papers? Who owned the slave ship? Who run the army? Who was the fake president? Who the ruler? Who the banker? Who the devil on the real side? Who got rich from Armenian genocide? Who the biggest terrorist? Who changed the Bible? Who killed the most people? Who do the most evil? Who don't worry about survival? Who have the colonies? Who stole the most land? Who rule the world? Who say they good but only do evil? Who the biggest executioner? Who, 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 who? Own the oil. Who want more oil? Who told you what you think that later you find out is a lie? Oh, oh. Who found Bin Laden? Maybe they say. Who paid the CIA? Who knew the bomb was gonna blow? Who know how the terrorists learned to fly in Florida, in San Diego? Who knew why five Israelis was filming the explosion? Cracking their size at the notion. Who need fossil fuel when the sun ain't going nowhere? Who make the credit cards? Who get the biggest tax cut? Who walked out of the conference against racism? Who killed Malcolm? 
Kennedy and his brother who killed Dr. King who would want such a thing are they linked to the murder of Lincoln who invaded Grenada who made money from apartheid who keep the Irish a colony who overthrew Chile and Nicaragua later who killed David Sebeco, Chris Hani the same ones who killed Biko, Cabral, Neruda, Allende, Che Guevara, Sandino who killed Kabila, the ones who wasted Lumumba, Manlane, Betty Shabazz, Princess Di, Ralph Featherstone, Lil Bobby locked up Mandela, Deruba, Geronimo, Asada, Mumia, Garu, Yasho Hammond, Alfea Sutton who killed Huey Newton Fred Hampton, Medgar Evers, Mikey Smith, Walter Rodney. Was it the ones who tried to poison Fidel? Who tried to keep the Vietnamese oppressed? Who put a price on Lenin's head? Who put the Jews in ovens? And who helped them do it? Who said America first and okay the yellow stars? Ho, ho! Who killed Rosa Luxemburg, Liebnet, who murdered the Rosenbergs, and all the good people iced, tortured, assassinated, banished, who got rich from Algeria, Libya, Haiti, Iran, Iraq, Saudi, Kuwait, Lebanon, Syria, Egypt, Jordan, Palestine, who cut off people's hands in the Congo, who invented AIDS, who put the germs in the Indians' blankets, who thought up the Trail of Tears, who blew up the Maine and started the Spanish-American War, who got Sharon back in power, who backed Batista, Hitler, Bilbo, Chiang Kai-shek, who, 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 who? Who decided affirmative action had to go? Reconstruction, the New Deal, the New Frontier, the Great Society, who do Tom S. Clarence work for? <laughs> Who do do come out the colon's mouth? Who know what kind of skeezer is a Condoleezza? <laughs> Who pay Connolly to be a wooden Negro? Who give genius awards to homo locus subsidiary? Who overthrew Nkrumah, Bishop? who poisoned Robeson, who tried to put Du Bois in jail, who framed rap Jamil Alamin, who framed the Rosenbergs, Garvey, the Scottsboro Boys, the Hollywood Ten. Who set the Reichstag fire? Who knew the World Trade Center was gonna get bombed? Who told 4,000 Israeli workers at the Twin Towers to stay home that day? Why did Sharon stay away? Who, 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 who? Explosion of owl, the newspapers say, devil's face could be seen. Explosion of owl, the newspapers say, the devil's face could be seen. Who? 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 Who make money from war? Who make dough from fear and lies? Who want the world like it is? Who want the world to be ruled by imperialism and national oppression and terror, violence and hunger and poverty? Who is the ruler of hell? Who is the ruler of hell? Who is most powerful? Who you know ever seen God? But everybody's seen the devil. Like an owl exploding in your life, in your brain, in yourself. Like an owl who know the devil all night all day if you listen like an owl exploding in fire like an owl exploding in your life in your brain in yourself like an owl who know the devil all night all day if you listen like an owl exploding in fire we hear the questions rise in terrible flame like the whistle of a crazy dog like the acid vomit of the fire of hell. Who and who and who, 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 who,
All right, y'all, we're going to be moving into our next panel. So thank you again, panelists. We truly, truly appreciate it. So please, the next panelist, please make your way to the front so we can get you guys situated and get straight into the next panel. Again, if you are going to post anything about this conference on social media, please please use the hashtag Hewitt Conference so we can find you. Hopefully later we're able to like retweet you and all of that. Thank you again. Um, if you needed to use the restroom, they're right out the door to the right, in case anybody was wondering. Um, <laughs> and after this panel, we will be going into an intermission for about an hour, and then we will be continuing the second half of the conference. Thank you all. Oh, thank you. Can somebody put my Oh, yeah, sure. Right, I'm going to stop this one.